Ya empiece. Good evening and uh, welcome to um, the, the webinar series that we've been doing with the Colombian Foreign uh, Ministry. Uh, today we have a, a fantastic uh, webinar about something that it's a little bit different. Do you remember when you're in your apartment and all of a sudden 11 o'clock at night you start hearing a strange noise on the other side of the wall? Do you remember when all of a sudden you get a great smell in your apartment and it's the apartment upstairs cooking those unexpected neighbors? That's not what we're going to talk. We're going to talk about a different unexpected neighbor, the neighbor in your habitat, the neighbor in your city, the neighbor that you don't expect. Unexpected Neighbors is a documentary that um, was filmed in Bogota and we're going to talk about it uh, today in the Environment Day. And we have some fantastic guests, but um, this is a presentation and I'm the ambassador of Colombia, Francisco Santos in the United States is made by the Colombian Foreign Ministry, by the Embassy of Colombia in Canada, by the Embassy of Colombia at the UN and obviously the one here in Washington. Let's hear from our colleagues uh, um, saying hello to all of our guests today in this uh, program about unexpected neighbors. Dear friends, I would like to welcome you to this panel to discuss the documentary Vecinos Inesperados. The permanent mission of Colombia to UN, along with the embassies of Colombia to Canada and the United States, and the permanent mission of Colombia to the OES, wanted to show the incredible biodiversity that exists in my country. We are the second most biodiverse country in the world. There are more birds, amphibians, butterflies, and plant species here than anywhere else. As host of the celebration of the World Environment Day, last June 5th, President Duque reaffirmed our commitment to protect nature and reiterate the global trend of biodiversity loss is threatening our survival as a species and the future of our planet. I want to thank you for your presence today and I hope that you enjoy this presentation. Bienvenidos a este conversatorio sobre el documental Vecinos Inesperados organizado desde la Cancillería en un esfuerzo conjunto con todas sus misiones en el exterior. Esperamos que esta actividad nos conduzca a reflexionar sobre la necesidad de sumar acciones para promover una sana convivencia con la biodiversidad presente en los ambientes urbanos. Disfruten de este evento. On behalf of this embassy, I would like to welcome you to the presentation of the documentary Unexpected Neighbors and to its subsequent discussion. For la Colombie, la preservation de l'environnement, la protection des espèces et l'équilibre holistique entre la nature et l'être humain sont très importants. C'est pour ça que nous espérons que vous apprécierez cet événement qui fait partie des célébrations de la Journée internationale de l'environnement. Merci beaucoup. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues. Today we are celebrating the Day of the Environment, and that's why Unexpected, Unexpected Neighbors, uh, a documentary about everything we encounter that we sometimes don't see in a, the human environment and how lively the human environment is uh, regarding the animals that surround us and that sometimes we, uh, we don't even perceive, is part of the discussion we're going to have today. Um, let's see first some short of uh, this documentary that I know you will enjoy. Thank you. 
will talk about uh, this uh, amazing, amazing uh, documentary, Unexpected Neighbors or Vecinos Inesperados, about Bogota and all that fauna that you saw in this little preview. Um, we have two fantastic persons, one of them, the executive producer, the filmmaker, and the writer, Mauricio Ellis, and the other one, one of the top environmentalists from Colombia, Christian Samper. I met him many years ago when he was head of the Smithsonian, and now he's the head of um, World Life Conservation Society. He knows what Colombia is all about. He knows about our hub of the environment, and I think we're going to have a great discussion about uh, this documentary. But Mauricio, before we start uh, talking about the documentary, one, why don't you tell us how did you become uh, a filmmaker, a documentarist uh, uh, regarding nature? And uh, when we were talking and we we're preparing this documentary, you told us about how this relationship uh, with Christian Samper has many, many, many decades. You're still doing the same. And yet this is one of the biggest products you have produced. <laughs> well, Thank you very much, Ambassador Santos, for this uh, warm welcome. Uh, as director and writer of the documentary, of the film, I want to start by expressing my gratitude to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Colombia for inviting us to celebrate uh, the World Environment Day. I feel very honored to have the opportunity to share unexpected neighbors in the company of the Colombian Embassy in Canada, the Colombian Embassy in the US, in the missions of Colombia in the United Nations and the Organization of American States. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. And I also want to give a warm welcome to our guests who join us from Canada. I have, a, I have had the privilege of uh, living in Montreal for eight years, and I thank you for your presence. Je souhaite également une chaleureuse bienvenue à nos invités qui nous accompagnent du Canada. J'ai le privilège de vivre à Montréal depuis huit ans. Merci pour votre présence. Unexpected uh, Neighbors was produced by the Bogota's Mayor Office through the Secretary of Culture, Recreation and Sports with, with the support of the Bogota Aqueduct and Sewer Company. And I want to thank the Mayor of Bogota and each and all of the members of the Mayor's Office uh, and team that made this project possible. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I've been fascinated by nature documentaries and uh, I fantasized about traveling the world and making wildlife documentaries. So as a director and script writer, uh, this film is a dream come true. A dream that has taken more than 30 years to realize. And I'm very honored to team up with Christian uh, in this conversation because it was thanks to him that my desire to make wildlife films stopped being a childish fantasy and became a dream. And I believe strongly there's a big distinction between fantasy and dreams. For me, fantasies are illusions that live in the mind and stay in the mind. Dreams, on the other hand, uh, are the force that drives us uh, through life and through our actions, our dedication, our hard work, and the support of others, uh, dreams can become true. And here's where my path with Christian crosses. Back in 1996, he interviewed me for a position as communications coordinator of the Humboldt Institute, of which he was the director. And I shared with him my dream of making films about Colombia's wildlife and biodiversity. Uh, and he, said something that I'll never forget. He said, why don't you join us? Let's dream together. Let's make this dream come true. Uh, and then he added, the sky is the limit. So Christian, thank you very much for your support. It is an honor for me to team up with you again. Christian, since, uh, and, and look where he is, you know, aren't, don't you uh, envy him? Uh, Christian is right now in a in a fantastic place. Look at his uh, at his environment, and as one of the most prominent environmentalists, uh, we wouldn't expect anything less. Christian, uh, how did you uh, become an environmentalist, and and how does this movie become part of this new narrative about what Colombia is and and where we are? 
Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Santos. And let me also join in thanking uh, the embassies for this invitation uh, for this. It's uh, in some ways a dream come true for me as well. And I just want to say how happy I am to with this re-encounter of Mauricio. As he said, we met almost 30 years ago when we were starting the Humboldt Institute, the Biodiversity Institute in Colombia after the Earth Summit in Rio. And um, as a young biologist that had just returned to Colombia, I was invited to uh, create this dream and build this institute. And Mauricio was one of this uh, early people that joined me. And I'm extremely proud to see what he has done over the years and to have this opportunity to share, which was a, a completely unexpected coincidence. But uh, let me say, Mauricio, I'm very proud for everything you've done. And uh, let's keep dreaming together and let's make it happen. Uh, Ambassador, you know, I, I actually grew up in Bogota. Uh, so as a young child, I also spend my weekends hiking those mountains that we're going to see in this film. I've always said that, uh, and then I became a scientist, and I've always said that a scientist is a kid that never really grows up. Because we're always asking questions about the world around us and really wondering what the planet is. Uh, I also had the privilege of seeing many of these nature documentaries, uh, documentaries by Jacques Cousteau or David Attenborough or others, and it inspired me to look at this world, and I decided to become a biologist. Uh, I had the support of my family, I did this, and it was an incredible opportunity to do this, and uh, that's what I pursued. As many biologists, I started with a scientific question, then I realized many of the areas were being transformed, we're losing some of the biodiversity, and uh, then I decided to do something about it. I've been very privileged to be able to combine science with education and policy throughout my career, and I'm a very firm believer of the power of these documentaries. Now, for those guests that are with us that don't know that much about Colombia, as was mentioned before, uh, Colombia is one of the most biologically diverse countries in the planet, second by most accounts in the world, probably only after Brazil. And it's partly an incredible uh, consequence of our richness of the place where we're located in the northern corner of South America. It was a bridge between two continents and also a barrier between two oceans because we have these two oceans. And the net result is Colombia covers about 1% of the surface of the planet, and yet it has about 10% of all the species that are found on the planet. And Bogota is this amazing city living way up in the mountains, 8,500 feet, 2,600 meters above. And this area of the Andes is incredibly rich in species and many species that are only found here. And the remarkable thing is the species that you see in this documentary in the mountains have learned to coexist with the people and it's an incredible story. And I think what Mauricio has done is a re remarkable job of showing us how wildlife coexists with cities. And of course, what I, we can come back to discussing later is I'm a very firm believer that cities are a powerful engine, engine for conservation in the future. So I look forward to this dialogue and this con conversation. Mauricio, how did, how did unexpected neighbors came to be? Uh, how uh, something is wonderful, and by the way, to all of you, you can see this uh, this uh, video on uh, on um, on YouTube. You just put unexpected unexpected neighbors, and you will uh, and you will see it. O vecinos inesperados, and you will see it. Uh, how did it become? How, what was the process of doing uh, this documentary? Uh, how, how did it happen? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting way because um, the mayor's office in Bogota carried out a survey back in the early 2018 um, about the people's perception of wildlife in the city. And through the survey, uh, they learned that 80% uh, of Bogotanos and Bogotanas believe that wildlife in the city was scarce and only 10% and 10 considered that it was non-existent. And when asked to mention one animal, one wild animal in Bogota, almost 60% of people were unable to mention one species. So um, the results motivated um, the administration, uh, the mayor, uh, through the Secretary of Culture, Recreation and Sports uh, and their team, to design a strategy of uh, citizen culture to raise awareness about the capital's natural environments, about the ex existence of uh, wildlife in Bogota, uh, in an effort to motivate people to care, to cherish, and to appreciate the city's biodiversity and its natural richness. So, so it is 
It is basically a communication strategy to raise awareness about uh, the city's wildlife. Christian, Bogota is a city that is 2,600 meters high, which is a, a, you know, a lot more than most of the cities. It's way, 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 way up there. Um, how does that change the ecosystems around it? Uh, how particular is Bogota in such an amazing place? You know, it used to be uh, thousands of years ago, and not too many, it used to be a lake. Uh, it's now a wonderful savanna. Uh, uh, it has mountain peaks and, and the paramos uh, uh, right around it. How does that create this special um, uh, type of, uh, of environment that is portrayed in the, um, in, the, in the movie, in the documentary? Well, it's a, thank you, Ambassador. It's been a story that's been unfolding for millions of years with the rise of the Andes. As you know, the plate tectonics coming together here started to rise in the eastern Andes uh, of Colombia, which is where Bogota is located, um, has been an area that's on the eastern side. You've got the Llanos Orientales and the Amazonian region. Then you've got the Magdalena River on the other side. So it's at a perfect convergence of these areas. Because Colombia is right on the equator, what you find is even though the city, as you said, is very high up in the mountains, 8,500 feet, 2,600 meters, what we find is that many of the species here, it's, it's, it, it, they're tropical species at high elevation. And there's some very unique uh, ecosystems that are only found in this part of Colombia and some of the area neighboring countries. One of those that you're going to see in the film is what we call the Andean Paramo, which are these areas at high elevation above the forest timberline that are these alpine grasslands, these mountain grasslands. We have these extraordinary plants like frailejones, the Espaletias and others. And these areas are incredible because most of the species we find there are found nowhere else on the planet. And they're also incredible factories for water. And the water of the city of 8 million people comes straight from those mountains. The other issue, as you mentioned, is the, the savanna used to be an old lake. And you'll see some images of the rivers running through. And the wetlands that were found in this area were incredibly important. And again, because these were isolated areas after the periods of glaciation. Now, you have many species that evolved in these isolated mountain peaks and are found nowhere else on the planet. So I think it's an incredible richness, an incredible blessing, and also an incredible responsibility for the people of Bogota and Colombians to look after this biodiversity. And I do believe that creating awareness about what we have and what we share is the first step toward being able to build sustainable cities and a better future for all of us. Mauricio, one of the reasons why they did this documentary is because a lot of the kids were asked, do you see any fauna around in the city? And most of them said no. But it's so so that means that it's really hard to find those animals. And, and to find all that biodiversity that is hidden all over the city and that you have to really look after it. What, how complex was it uh, filming these documentaries? What problems did you encounter? How many people were involved? How, how did this came to be? <laughs> um, the effort behind Unexpected Neighbors was monumental. Altogether, 169 persons were involved in some capacity uh, in the production of the film. Uh, it took us 15 months to research, 12 months to prepare, 130 days to shoot, uh, to shoot in 48 different locations. And believe me, Bogota is huge. We filmed altogether uh, 40 different species of Bogotanos and Bogotanas including spectacle bears and pumas, coatis, deer, foxes, owls, eagles, crabs, native and migratory birds, um, and insects. Uh, really a cast of wonderful characters uh, that bring this film to life. Um, we also invested four months in post-production, which included the cataloging, the selecting of footage. Uh, think about this, we had almost 80 terabytes of footage uh, writing the script, assembling the film, editing sound, color correction. We performed more than a million and a half 
color correction operations through the through the editing process, which is a monumental work. Uh, and we uh, and, and the music uh, we composed uh, 36 different themes of music for the documentary. Uh, one of the very nice things about the documentary also, I believe, is that Bogota's Philharmonic Orchestra interpreted the music composed by Maestro uh, Daniel Velasco. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things about the premiere was that uh, the, the more or less 8,000 spectators who were present during the premiere uh, had the opportunity and the privilege of watching the film in synchronization with the orchestra playing live. Uh, and that was breathtaking. For me as a director, it was absolutely astonishing. Um, now, as you said, uh, filming the animals in a city and capturing their amazing behavior is very hard. Uh, just finding them in Bogota is difficult. But uh, thankfully, we had a great team of researchers that help us with the animals. We had support from five different universities, uh, biology students, professors, experts from various institutions. Uh, and we had one of the most talented uh, directors of uh, wildlife directors of photography in the world, Richard Kirby. We had a very experienced producer running the show, Lina Andrade. And uh, we have that support from the mayor and the secretary of culture, recreation and sports and their wonderful team. So for me, thanks to all this support that I have in the, in the production, for me, really the most challenging aspect of the project was telling a compelling story, one that gripped the audience emotionally. Um, writing the script was really difficult. We had too many animals, we had too many characters, we had too many locations, too many stories, too much information, and too much science. It was really extremely hard to solve all these issues and to find a clear way to focus the story, uh, to find a narrative thread, and a dramatic thrust that drives the film in a very organic manner. Um, we were concerned with offering information about the wildlife, about delivering a message that solved the problems discovered uh, in the survey. And if the survey indicated that people did not know about Bogota's wildlife, our obvious mission was to show its wildlife. After all, nobody takes care of what they don't know. So, as I wrote uh, draft after draft, I finally came to the understanding that uh, I had something wrong and that was happening was that I had become obsessed with the message. Now you see, to deliver a message, we use stories. Stories, stories serve sort of like a Trojan horse, uh, if you will, to communicate messages in an effective way. And to do this, we tell the story of a character through its conflict and the change through the film. But in Unexpected Neighbors, our characters didn't change, just a few do. So it wasn't until I realized that the real transformational character was the audience itself and not the stories of the animals, that I understood how to approach the writing of, of, of this film. Um, why the transformation of the audience? Because in reality, everything that really matters is that when the audience goes into the, into the film uh, without knowing about the animals, without really caring for them, we want them to come out of the film feeling completely di different. Caring, cherishing them, and realizing that they're neighbors and that they're important for the city's survival as an ecosystem. Um, so I decided to write to create emotional impact more than to deliver a message. Thinking that if I created that emotional impact, um, I was going to be able to sort of, the message would be able to hitchhike on the emotions. So I wrote to appeal to the audience and sense of wonder, its curiosity, its surprise, empathy, interest, humor, and dramatic tension. So, um, that was basically the most challenging thing. And to show you what I mean, I want to share with you a video uh, that shows, um, it's a video about, it's a sequence about uh, frogs courting. And we turn this sequence not into a 
courtship sequence, but into a love story. And I want to share it with you. We can roll the, the film now. Now, this was quite a um, challenging sequence to produce. Desde muy temprano, se escucha su croar para atraer pareja. Because it's shot at night, very dark conditions. We have fantastic macro photography. Um, and we also use some underwater production techniques. So I, as I was saying, this was a very difficult sequence to produce. I'm sorry, I think we, we didn't uh, have audio in it. At least I couldn't hear it. But um, basically we combined, as I said, night shooting uh, techniques with underwater photography and macro photography, which it's sort of a nightmare for, for, for a director of photography. And I think Richard accomplished a fantastic um, uh, result. Um, in the cinema, these images are simply beautiful and breathtaking. And we see the animals' textures, we see their eyes huge, their hands, which are just like ours, and their intense color um, in a surprising way that sparks our interest and curiosity. So that was the most important aspect. We, I, I wanted the audience to feel absolutely surprised with this animal. Uh, we also surprised the audience by showing that this is something that happens, that this scene actually happens in a place where it's less, least expected, right under our faces, in front of a building in the middle of Bogota. Uh, but thanks to a brilliant shot at the end, when the two frogs hold their hands, the scene establishes a strong emotional connection between the audience and the frogs. We all see ourselves reflected in that moment. It is no longer a scene about two frogs. It is a scene about two beings, two beings that care about each other, just like humans do. And Christian, precisely in that direction, cities are an integral part of the solution to climate change, to most of the environmental problems. And like the scene with the frogs where in the end, they join hands. How can we make sustainable cities where humans development and environment can join hands and make us understand that sustainable cities are important? How do we make more sustainable cities in the future? Christian, okay, you're, no. Christian, you're mute. Okay, you got, got oh. me now? Okay. Yes, we, we get you now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, um, 
the human footprint on the planet with more than 7 billion people is one of the greatest challenges. How do we feed and improve the quality of life of so many people without destroying the environment and the rest of the life on Earth? And I do believe cities are a fundamental part of the solution. The good news is more than 50% of the people of the planet live in cities now. And in Latin America, as much as 80% of the people live in these cities. And of course, cities are incredible laboratories for innovation. They're places where we can provide better services, education, so many things for people. And if we think about the cities holistically and we design them in the right way, they can also be very important places for biodiversity. And I do want to say I, I admire so much the vision that someone like Mayor Peñalosa has had of building these cities in the future for not only Bogota, but other cities around the planet. I think part of what we need to really look at here is by concentrating these people, by educating them, by changing the consumption patterns, by building buildings, uh, adopting transportation systems, all of these are things that can be positive for environment. At the same time, we need to make sure we look at protecting the surrounding areas to the cities. And that's why the example of Bogota with the Paramo that you'll see in the film and Chigas is such a great example where you have a city of 8 million people right next to one of these water factories in this incredible ecosystem that's providing the water and some of the resources of Bogota and uh, the city are going back to protect the conservation. And I think there's a bigger vision here about how we build, for example, corridors and connectivity, how we restore wetlands around the city. And I think what we're seeing here in cities like New York and many other cities around the world is we can really design cities where the human footprint in the cities and from cities in the near nearby territories can be much, much lower. And I think that is the paradigm for us to shift and to really be able to look at. And I think Bogota has started in that trajectory. There's still a lot of work to do, but I think we can really work together to build a sustainable city in Bogota or Medellin or other cities in Colombia and around the world. And that's exactly what we need to be able to build that sustainable future. And, but Christian, uh, in that sense, uh, with this pandemic, with the coronavirus, we saw cities, people inside the cities, but inside their homes, and all of a sudden, the animals that were hiding start to come out. In Bogota, we saw uh, un oso hormiguero, which you don't see right in the one of the most important highways near the mountain. How do you build a, a city in which that interaction doesn't need a pandemic so that it can happen? How, how do you start creating those uh, spaces so that environment and these fantastic animals that you see in, uh, in, in this documentary can live hand by hand and not, uh, and not us expanding and just uh, eliminating or, or, or creating places where no animal can live? I, I think that's a, a very much a, a very relevant question, of course, uh, because what we see is this pandemic, of course, in some ways has hit pause on the cities and on the world, and it's had unintended consequences. We've seen dramatic drops in the levels of uh, uh, CO2 and many others. As you say, we're seeing all these images of animals that live in the cities coming out. We, they have space now, and I think part of the message here is nature is sending us a message. But one of the things I've learned working for more than 30 years in conservation is that nature can be resilient and wildlife is there. What we need to do is give them that space. And part of what we need to do is create green spaces in the cities. We can transform and build green roofs. We can connect these areas by building those corridors that allow wildlife to move. And I think even our own behaviors and practices that we can take are really important. Another example, for example, uh, that's brought up in the documentary is the impact that cities and buildings in particular can have on migratory birds. This is a real problem. We have many, many species that move from North America. So many of the species in Canada and the United States, like the warblers that we had here through New York just last month, are species that are spending their winters down in places like Colombia, and they will hit buildings here and they'll hit buildings there. The good news is there are many steps we can take by using different kinds of glass, by designing the buildings differently. There are things that we can do in the way we design cities that will make them more friendly to wildlife. And we just have to give wildlife some space. And if we do that, I think we'll start discovering the wildlife and we will learn that we'll have people that are healthier and happier because we're really doing this. And I think this documentary does a great job of just peaking that curiosity, parting the curtain and allowing us to discover their world. And if we take the time 
to study, to think, to look. And we look at this, and as many of the uh, characters that are shown in the documentary, we can all work together to have a really big impact and have a city where we can live along with wildlife. Mauricio, there's there's a fantastic scene that, that uh, oh, believe me, my heart was pounding because I saw myself as a young kid uh, uh, playing soccer in a field and all of a sudden shooting the ball and it destroys a nest with eggs of an alcaravan, of a bird. And it's, it's terrific to be, and I was like, oh my God, are they going to shoot it? And you see them going right next to the, right next to the, to the, to the birding, the, to the nesting place. And, uh, and it's an, a fantastic scene and a fantastic place that shows two things. One, the alcaravan is now higher in altitude and two, they can live in places that we play all the time, etc. How did that scene get to be done? And what does that scene tell us as inhabitants of a city that need to respect those spaces too? Well, I invite you to see the scene and I'll go, I'll go through the uh, answers as we see it, but let's just watch the scene and when it's done, uh, we can talk about it. Sin embargo, para algunos padres primerizos, las cosas no siempre salen como se planean. Un campo bien protegido parece el lugar ideal para anidar. Salvo por un pequeño detalle, este no es un campo común y corriente. Estos nuevos residentes son oriundos de tierras bajas, como los llanos orientales y el Tolima. Los alcaravanes no construyen nidos para resguardar sus huevos. En su lugar, se apoderan del terreno en el que los ponen. Y cuando su dominio es penetrado, recurren a toda suerte de tácticas para disuadir a los invasores. El alcarabán macho entra en alerta. Al ver que la amenaza no se detiene, ella abandona el nido. Es una táctica para llamar la atención del intruso y alejarlo de los huevos. Parece que es hora de escalar la respuesta defensiva. Y atacan con dos espuelas que tienen en las alas. Los estudiantes aprenderán a compartir su cancha, pues sus nuevos vecinos llegaron para quedarse. <laughs> well, I'm so happy you brought up this uh, this scene, Mr. Ambassador, and I'm, I'm I'm glad you liked it because it was uh, very inspirational. I'm also happy to tell you that this scene was actually shot by a Colombian crew. Uh, director of photography for this scene was Juan Pablo Bueno. He's a biologist and a very talented uh, camera, uh, cameraman. Uh, he spent with, uh, with, with a small team, it was a second unit, uh, the better part of a week uh, shooting this uh, sequence. Uh, so, so you can imagine how difficult it is to make sure to get the, the behavior and to, to have all these challenges and the tension building up. Uh, the scene was inspired by a visit that we made to the Center of Athletic Performance uh, and we saw 
um, one of these uh, southern lopwings attack one of the athletes. So it was so funny because he was a very big guy. He was practicing shot put. And uh, we saw the Alcaravan attack him. And this guy was running and jumping and just throwing himself to the ground, trying to avoid the Alcaravan. <laughs> because the southern um, lapwings have thorns in their wings. So they can really hurt you if they, if they scratch your face. Uh, so it was very humorous. And um, that was during the, the scouting. So we said, we have to have this scene. By the time we went for production, the nesting couple in the center of, of athletic performance was no longer there. So we had to start looking for another couple as, elsewhere. And we found this couple uh, at a soccer field in the heart of Bogota. And it was like such a gift from God. Um, it is very important because it shows how humans and animals compete for the same space. It's like a territorial dispute. Um, and it ultimately shows that we can share our space with animals. Uh, and I know that for Christian, the scene has a different, a, a different meaning and a different significance and different importance. And I'll be happy or I would like him to, to share his uh, thoughts about it. Christian, what do you think about it? I know, I, I know where, where Mauricio is going, but this scene has a great implication for what's happening to the world. Can you explain us? Yes, I'll be happy. And let me just start by saying I've actually been in the receiving end of the Al Caravan uh, in the field a few times. Uh, and they um, they can really come at you and it's important. No, what I was mentioning to Mauricio and the documentary mentions it that's interesting is um, this is a species that when I was growing up in Bogota, you would never see. Because as the documentary mentions, it's a species that's found in the lower elevation areas in the Llanos and the Magdalena Valley and others. And what has been happening is, as we've been seeing the impacts of global warming, we're seeing that wildlife is adapting to this. And one of the things that's happening is many of the lowland species are moving up toward Bogota and to these areas. So Algarabanes and many other species that we see now are species you would have never seen 30, 40, 50 years ago when I was a kid growing up there. And I think it's a powerful reminder about how our impacts of humans are changing, how we're changing the planet, but also how nature can adapt to it. Is in this case a new neighbor that would not have been there, and uh, I think it's a it's a powerful reminder. The challenging issues, some of the mountains behind Bogota, those paramos that I mentioned, the species are being pushed up the mountains, and the species in the highest elevations are going to run out of space. They're literally not going to have anywhere to go, and uh, we're going to lose some of these species if we don't do something about climate change. And I think that's a commitment that we all need to live up to as biologists and as citizens. When uh, when you see the, the movie and, and you saw the frog scenes and you saw the Alcaravan scenes and, and you have, there are so many scenes and, it, and they're so delicately uh, filmed and, and it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to see it. Um, my personal favorite was the Alcaravan because I was suffering. Uh, Mauricio, what, what was your, your, your personal... Uh, uh, the, the scene that you personally liked the most, so that, uh, and why was it? <laughs> it is very hard to say which one I liked the most because I really enjoyed most of them. But there's one that captured my attention very particularly. Um, and it was from a script writer's perspective and then from a photographical perspective. I needed one of the animals to show. Uh, the phases of life that we go through as humans and as beings, uh, birth, growth, reproduction, and death. And we were able to capture that transformation in one animal. It's the scene about uh, larvae that it, it's born and then it becomes a caterpillar and then the caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly and then the butterfly goes off and gets eaten by a crab. It is beautifully shot. You can almost touch the texture of the wings. Uh, the eyes are, are amazing. The macro photography when it's projecting the large screen is just absolutely breathtaking. And uh, I want you to, I want to share the scene with you. 
cartas de piel. Leptofobia aripa aripa nos sorprende con el cambio extremo más drástico que existe en el mundo animal. Este cambio de forma se llama metamorfosis. Las mariposas no pueden regular su temperatura. Por eso, Leptofobia deberá esperar que el sol caliente su cuerpo y seque sus alas antes de emprender el primer vuelo de su vida. Existen unas 3.300 especies de mariposas en Colombia. Las mariposas viven en promedio un mes. Las que más alcanzan hasta un año de vida. Otras, como esta, conocida como mariposa de la col, viven entre una y dos semanas. Nuestro planeta ha sido escenario del milagro de la vida durante casi una tercera parte de la edad del universo, un milagro que se da en cada rincón de la Tierra, hasta el lugar más inesperado de todos, nuestra casa. Aquí, en el barrio Guiparma, Leptofobia Aripa Aripa disfruta el néctar que ofrecen las flores de esta terraza. Tiene pocos días para reproducirse y pasar la luz de la vida a una nueva generación de mariposas. El propósito más importante de toda su existencia en la Tierra. O tal vez no. Conocidas como araña cangrejo porque tienen dos largas patas frontales y son capaces de moverse lateralmente como un cangrejo, estas arañas son expertas cazadoras de mariposas. Afortunadamente, los padres de leptofobia Aripa Aripa tuvieron en cuenta la posibilidad de que algunos de sus hijos muriesen y depositaron decenas de huevos. Saben que mantenerse con vida es solo parte de la historia. Asegurar la existencia de futuras generaciones es la misión. So this scene really captures the essence of what the film is about. We see the drama of life unfolding in a terrace in a neighborhood 
in downtown Bogota. Um, and I, I, I really believe that it was uh, absolutely astonishingly captured by Richard. Uh, and one of the missions that we had visually um, was to capture um, the scenes from almost impossible angles or impossibly close to the animals to give the sense that they were they are larger than life, to give the sense that we as spectators are the size of the animal, that we are sort of uh, looking them straight into their eyes. So to see the, the crab spider just do like this in that flower, preparing to launch its attack on, on the butterfly, uh, it's, it's, it creates a dramatic tension that, uh, that is very compelling. So I really enjoyed this, this uh, the entire sequence. We only saw half of it. Uh, but it very much also celebrates uh, the fact that we live together. It's, it's, it's an ecosystem in a terrace in a city. Um, and we celebrate the fact that humans and animals can share that terrace and, and look at the magic that happens when, when that occurs. Uh, Christian, what is your favorite scene? Well, there are many that I like. Um... Uh, I mean, this one was stunning, and let me just say the photography of this was quite extraordinary. But one of the ones that was, for me, most uh, amazing was the images of the fox that shown uh, both in the city, but in particular that scene in the shot, I think, in the mountains right behind Bogota in the forest there, where you see this fox coming in and hunting and finding this crab, which happens to be an endangered and endemic and critically endangered species of crab that's found there. And the fact that you filmed that by this pond and whatever, the, the, just the fact that you were able to capture that image was amazing. I spent a lot of time as a kid, as a young biologist, hiking those mountains. I'd never seen anything like that, which was, reminds you of the power of using natural history documentaries to learn about behavior and see things that we would never be able to see. Uh, so that for me was one of those, uh, but there are many others. The Andean Paramo, the Andean Bear, uh, there are so many others, but that was one that I was marveled by it. And I think we may be able to see it. Uh, yes, we, we are. There we go. There's the mountain behind the city. Para los animales más osados, como este zorro, la ciudad está llena de oportunidades durante la noche. Es solo cuestión de encontrarlas y perder el miedo a toparse con los vecinos humanos. Afortunadamente, una intervención oportuna evita que el zorro se alimente de desperdicios. Él deberá buscar su sustento en el entorno al que pertenece. De vuelta en las montañas, el zorro encuentra uno de sus platos favoritos, un cangrejo sabanero que habita en cañadas y manantiales.
Well, that's my city, the city I love, Bogota. That's a documentary that you can see uh, uh, in YouTube. Um, let me thank uh, 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 former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, a man with a profound uh, uh, environmental uh, view of, of, uh, of cities. Um, let me thank his, uh, his administration for giving um, us members of uh, or, or citizens of Bogota and of Colombia and everybody in the world the possibility of seeing this amazing, amazing documentary. You just saw the tip of the iceberg. So um, I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, Mauricio, thank you, but we have some questions that I'm going to ask. And Christian, thank you. Uh, but there are some questions that I am going to ask to you. Uh, uh, what? Christian, what about the animals that are shown? This is an anonymous question. What are the animals that are shown in the film? What can you tell us about it? Uh, uh, how common they are? What, uh, what, which ones are, uh, are, uh, are uh, in danger, etc.? So uh, there's a whole range of species. I mean, a number of the species there are fairly common within the city. There's a wonderful scene of the copeton, the, the rufous colored sparrow, and how it's adapting to its behavior. All of us that have lived in the city know that bird very well, and it's done extremely well. There are some species that do better in these urban environments that in their nature. Uh, but there are also some endangered species uh, there. Uh, we didn't see the clips here of the Andean Paramo behind, but for example, there are some wonderful images of the Andean bear, which is the only species of bear found in, in South America. It's an incredible species uh, that is uh, vulnerable at this point in terms of how endangered it is. And it's also a place we have uh, many other species and, and some of the birds as well. Some of the local birds that we've seen like the tingua, and uh, some of the others are also endangered. So there are, I'd say there's a handful of the species that we see here that are endangered and for whom we have to watch out for and help them. Uh, there's a lot of other species that are actually thriving in the city. But I think with the, if we take the steps that we discussed before, we can make Bogota and other cities like Bogota more hospitable for wildlife and make sure that uh, we can coexist between people and wildlife. Uh Mauricio, there's, a, there's something that's really interesting. Uh, uh, Sam, Sam Hancock from the Emerald Planet TV sends you this message. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and to your st outstanding nature experts colleague. How can the Emerald Planet TV collaborate with you and your nature experts in featuring this topic and images of unexpected neighbors on one of our summer weekly TV programs? We, I think this needs to reach our worldwide viewers. Can we, uh, uh, how can, how can you help us? Can we uh, uh, use this uh, for those programs? Mr. Sam Hancock, executive producer, creator, and host of the Emerald Planet. Can they use this material? How can they use it? Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hancock, for, uh, for your comments. I think your question is very relevant. Our desire is for this film to be shown across the world. Um, it, it is, the mayor's office of Bogota, the, um, the owner of the rights of the documentary. So uh, we can, if you send us your information, we can put you in contact with them so that you establish a direct conversation. And I'm sure that uh, they'll be able to help you out with this request. And we will, we will help with that too. So, so when, uh, if you send us uh, the information, we will, uh, we will uh, work so that, that the mayor's office can, can allow you to use that, uh, that documentary. Christian, this is a very <laughs> interesting question. What can we learn about uh, the pandemic? Are not we the unexpected neighbors? Are not we invading uh, their environment? Well, I think one thing we've... Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. Um, I think we've one thing we've learned from the pandemic is we're a very good host. And uh, what we have here is a virus that has learned how to exploit uh, humans as a population of 7 billion uh, people on the planet. Now, as we all know, this pandemic has a zoonotic origin. It's actually a, a virus that is found in nature. Uh, based on the genetic studies that have come out in the last few weeks and months, we know that this is its origin in bats, like many other viruses that we get. And from bats, they're transmitted to other wildlife. And the biggest challenge that we have, of course, is the, uh, the human consumption of wildlife in some of these markets in Asia and other countries around the world 
um, and that increased contact between people and nature can also have unintended consequences for us. And in this case, we have become the, the hosts of this pandemic um, uh, because of our transportation globalization, it's been able to spread around the world. It just reminds us that as powerful as we are, we're still subject to the forces of nature. And I think we need to learn some lessons about this and to figure out how we can coexist anywhere around the world. Hey, another another question, and this one for Mauricio. I couldn't help but notice the color of the moon. Is that an effect that you just did, or was that the color that it had in one of the scenes that they showed? Actually, thank you for asking about that. We were so lucky that during our filming days, we had a lunar eclipse. But we were not only lucky because we had a lunar eclipse, we were blessed with the fact that on that particular night, Bogota had a completely clear sky. So we were able to capture the entire event from beginning to end and to show these magnificent images uh, of, of the bloody moon. Uh, and if I may add to uh, the viewer who commented about if we are the unexpected neighbors. Uh, at the end, uh, the film very much invites the viewers to consider the possibility that it is us who have invaded uh, the territory where animals used to thrive and where they have been thriving for thousands of years. We are the unexpected neighbors for the animals. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a dual relationship. It's a relationship in which we have to learn how to share the territory in which we both inhabit. Uh, and let me also thank the, the, the present administration of Bogota. Uh, uh, the mayor of Claudia Lopez allowed us to use uh, to use uh, this uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, promotion of Bogota and the environment. But uh, Christian, Mia is asking, cangrejos in Bogota? Can I have more information about this species? Um, it's actually something, as I mentioned before, uh, it's a species that's uh, found in this area. It's critically endangered. Yeah, I, I'd never seen them when I was a kid growing up there. And uh, I myself need to do some more research on some of these and talk to my friends at the National University and others. So I think we all need to learn about it together. Uh, but that, again, is one of the wonders of these documentaries that allow us to show us new facets of the world right around us. Um, and sometimes they're standing right in front of us. And let me mention one more thing. I think uh, the great thing about these natural history documentaries is it really brings science and communication together. And I know, Mauricio, many of these images you got by working with biologists, people have been looking at these things, by using technologies like camera traps to really find these places. And by using them, we can discover all these new behaviors, things that we would not have been able to see 10, 20, 30 years ago for sure. And I think that's the great thing. We're, we're entering a new era of discovery and learning about this and the beauty is we can learn and share at the same time to create greater awareness about the people of Bogotá and around the world about this biodiversity. Christian, um, absolutely I think uh, hats off uh, to our uh, team of um, researchers our, and our producer who for many months dedicated themselves to finding not only the animals but uh, trying to uh, discover what were the stories that could be told about them. And um, the finding of animals like the crab was the result of a dedicated effort uh, scrutinizing all possible um, wildlife in the city to tell the best stories. So I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with the work they did and I very much want to thank them for allowing us this uh, tremendous access we had to to the animals that we have seen. This is something that uh, probably no none of you can answer, but this is an idea for uh, for the mayor. Or can I get a T-shirt or a mug with some of those images? Uh, can that be done? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a very good question. I think that. Um, we should get the information from the viewer who uh, kindly asks for it, and we should contact the mayor's office to see if it's possible. I don't see why not. We have um, we have beautiful images, beautiful photography, 
So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they can make it happen. But um, once again, it's the mayor's office that has to take care of that uh, request. We will, we will tell the mayor's office that they should use images to promote, uh, to promote all, the, all of this. Not only the documentary, but what we have uh, around. Francisco Gutierrez asks, uh, um, Christian, uh, as former chairperson of the World Heritage Committee, I'd like to know what protection actions are considered in coordination with IUCN and UNESCO, and also what practices from other countries can be illustrative to reinforce actions in Colombia? Thank you. Well, Colombia has made a tremendous amount of progress in terms of uh, setting aside areas for conservation protected areas. About 14% of the country is set aside in 58 national parks. And one of those national parks is right there in the mountains behind Bogota, uh, which is Chingasa National Park and actually Suma Pass is another one. So two parks right in that area, which are, are very important areas. I'm, I don't think they're currently as world Her designated as World Heritage Sites. I think they should be because uh, they're so unique and I think we need to look at that. But I think the, the other thing that we need to look at is how we, uh, in IUCN, which was mentioned in the question, which is the World Conservation Union, one of the things that we do there is recognize different categories of protected areas. So everything from relatively intact national parks protecting ecosystems to areas where we have certain kinds of use, including recreational use. There's been a very important plan and measures taken by a number of administrations in Bogota to protect the forest and the mountains behind the city, which are an incredible place. Uh, for conservation, an important area, and also looking at urban areas that can be used for conservation. So we need a whole gamut of different categories of conservation, including World Heritage Sites. And the last question, Mauricio, are you planning to do other documentaries like this in other cities of Colombia? Which ones would you choose to do something like uh, you have done, like the one you did in Bogota? <laughs> well, it would be a dream to be able to do a documentary in Cali, because I'm originally from Cali and I grew up enjoying Cali's wildlife. It is incredible. Cali is located 1,000 meters above sea level, uh, right next to the uh, Western Cordillera. So we can see that interaction of the mountain and the city as well. Uh, and it is just a fascinating scenario where um, a, a humongous amount of animals and, uh, and, and diversity of wildlife can be seen. So um, yeah, because I'm from Cali and I know the region, I would love to do it. But I think that uh, Unexpected Neighbors should be an initiative um, that uh, is taken uh, in, all, in, in other cities like uh, Cartagena, Barranquilla, Medellin. Uh, the, the major cities, I think, need to share this uh, information and these emotions with, with their citizens uh, because um, they need to promote and they need to raise awareness about the importance of coexistence between humans and animals. Um, we are neighbors. We have to learn how to tolerate each other and live together. And that's not only relevant for Bogota, but for all the cities in Colombia, for the, for the main cities, and uh, hopefully for all the cities in the world. Okay, Mauricio, thank you. Thank you very much. What a great job you did. Uh, Christian, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to all of you, uh, please stay safe, take care. This bug is not going away anytime soon. And um, thanks to the Foreign Ministry for uh, its promotion uh, uh, of uh, this type of uh, projects and, uh, and the promotion campaign. And thank you to my colleagues from the Embassy of, at the OAS here in Washington, in uh, New York at the UN, and in uh, Canada, in uh, Ottawa, uh, again in the government of Canada. Thank you very much. Have a good night and I hope you enjoyed today's uh, webinar.